started. Good day, everybody. My name is Dr. Yenka de Folare. Um, um, the topic of this lecture is titled HIV Counseling and Testing, that is HCT, Treatment, Care, and Support. And this lecture is put together by I, Dr. Yenka de Folare, and Dr. Akonde of the Public of Mercy College of Medicine, UI. I'm from the Department of Psychiatry, College of Medicine. I once worked uh, with PEFRA for almost nine years as a counselor and a trainer counselor. The learning objective of this uh, lecture are the following. Students must be able to understand the integration of HIV counseling and testing into HIV prevention program. Students should be able to discuss health provider's role in maintaining confidentiality. Also, should be able to provide information about HIV testing to explain the meaning of positive and negative HIV test results. Also, students should be able to identify the need of the newly diagnosed HIV patients. Introduction. HIV is uh, one of the world's most devastating epidemics. It has physical, social, psychological, and economic effects on family, on individuals. The psychosocial effect on the mental health is, is so bothersome. And this is the reason why it is necessary that whosoever we take up the counseling and testing service provision must be well trained, must be able to give professional service to people. Even though the young people are particularly at risk of uh, HIV infection, and uh, for quite a number of reasons, that is why uh, HIV information has to be comprehensive and complete and they need to be psychosocial support added to read. So HIV and counseling and testing are provided by professionals because incorrect and incomplete knowledge about the virus and the risk associated to read is also very dangerous. Let's look at the definition of HIV counseling. It's an interaction between a counselor and a counseling, or we say a patient or a client, with the purpose of empowering the counselee to make informed decision and uh, to face the, the challenges associated with his or her status. Or need to say, is a dialogue whereby a counselor gives all comprehensive information about HIV cancer. It might be towards the decision to do the test, towards the decision to, to live with the outcome of the test. It might be towards the decision uh, to get into treatment and adhere to treatment. So there are so many decisions to take. That is why information has to be comprehensive from the beginning, from having contact with the pig, with the counselee at the point of entry into HIV program. It is a confidential discussion. This is very important. It's a confidential discussion between both of them because they may need to explore transmission risk, whereby the client, the, the, the counselor may want to talk about ease or sexual life or sexual risk. So there's need for confidentiality. It should not be overlooked. Let's look at the guiding principle of counseling and testing, HIV counseling and testing. Number one, information on HIV status has to be kept private. That is when the, the outcome of the result. Information can only be shared with providers who are directly involved in the care. This is what we call need to know or need to know basis. And the medical records are kept in a safe place. 
Now, the importance of HIV counseling and testing. HIV counseling and testing is very, very vital. It's the entry to care. It is important that somebody knows his or her HIV status because like we normally hear, you know they show for face. So it's only through testing that one can know. And before testing can take place, they need, there's need for counseling. As we have defined it as a dialogue between the counselor and the counselee to explore issues around HIV, to provide comprehensive information so that the person will be able to take informed decision. So the importance of the counseling and testing is to provide entry point to the comprehensive HIV treatment, care, and support to help identify, reduce behavior, risk behavior, and uh, make good information available to young people of childbearing age and their, fem and their partner. HIV counseling and testing, like we said, is the entry point to care. And what are the programs? So that the HIV, what are the programs where they enter into? Like a maternal child health HIV prevention. So the first thing is to screen for HIV. Like it's very common these days where when you're entering into a health facility, you are screened with a questionnaire on COVID. The same way when you're entering into maternal child health, you're pregnant, you want to access family planning, you will screen for HIV. And then you will be asked to be screened. You may reject anyway. So other programs, which one enters when you do counseling and testing, or where counseling and testing is placed at the entrance, are uh, prevention of unintended pregnancy, safe obstetric practices, that is for giving birth to children, um, infant feeding, taking care of uh, infants, newly born children, or when children are brought to the hospital, it may be required to do HIV tests. First, uh, the community action against HIV. You can go to the community and first do tests before you, you talk about educate them about HIV and offer the test to them. Then antiretroviral prophylaxis. That's a treatment for HIV. The first test before you enter such uh, care or program. So components of HIV counseling and testing. The components are one, informed consent, pre-test counseling and HIV education, HIV testing, post-test counseling, referral to HIV prevention and care. The same way I've listed is the same way it follows. Informed decision, pre-test counseling, the testing, the post-test, then referral to where a, a, which service is needed. So let's look at informed consent. Informed consent, we can say that it gives room for the person to decide. For the person to come to the hospital and say, go to that area, there's uh, counseling and testing there. The person, might, the person might go home. So for the person to have come to that point of doing counseling and testing, the person has decided because the person was informed that at that time, there's counseling and testing there. The person had decided to come, fine. The fact that the person come, comes doesn't mean that the person will do the test. So the person with the provided option to opt in, to refuse, and to opt in anytime he wants to opt in. So it is not coercion, it is not by force. It cannot be by force because there are so many decisions to take along the way. If the person is forced at the point of entry, is it possible to force the person all the way? No, it's not possible. So let's look at the other guiding principle. It's providing information about HIV, that the status will be kept private, and information will only be shared with those who are concerned. It's important to tell this person during the pretest counseling, the possible HIV your outcome, what the test could be, and uh, the care that is available, all the uh, services that is available for the person. So during the pre-test counseling, the person will have opportunity for risk assessments. 
what are the routes through which HIV can be transmitted? The person will be told, and while the person is being told, in the person's mind, the person will be assessing his or herself. May voice out, the person may voice out to the counselor on certain things and they will talk together. So the person will be told, will be told the possible HIV test result. The person will be given every the knowledge necessary about HIV. The partner possibility of couple counseling will be explored if the person wants to bring up the partner or not, whether at that point or later, the person will take that decision. Now let's look at the types of HIV, pre-HIV test counseling techniques. We have the opt-in. The person will just walk in to do the test and opt out. Even after being given the information, the person may still refuse to test. You may wonder that I refuse to step, do you mean refuse to test permanently or refuse to test for that time? Either of the two. But what is important is giving the person accurate, comprehensive information which will stay with the person. So it is possible that this person may come back. The person may not come back to your own point where you offer the service. The person may go to primary health centers where the service is being offered or any other place. But at one point or the other, the person will do the test. It may be unknown to you. So the process of counseling and testing, we have the pre-test, which is a group education. An example is the antenatal clinic where you have to, uh, many uh, pregnant women seated together assessing the antenatal care and you give them education about HIV, tell them everything, they ask questions. That is a good one. So you may wonder, can they consent as a group? No, each individual will consent because it's not possible to do the, the test as a group. Each person comes in to do the test or go to this testing area to do the test. But listening to the counseling or the education can be together. Questions can be asked in the group. And you may wonder that we said, we talk, I talked about confidentiality. So where is the confidentiality in group counseling? The, 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 during the test, the, why the person comes as, as a, I mean privately to do the test, the person may ask questions. The person may, may, may request for personal talk with the counselor is allowed. So post HIV counseling. Post HIV counseling comes up after the test. And this is the point where the result is being given, the outcome of the test. It can either be positive or negative. At times it can be inconclusive. Anyway, anyway. So Let's look at the process through which this uh, counseling takes place. The post-test support and services is what I want to talk about now. Always give the, the test in, in person. Do not send texts. Do not send it by text. Do not give it by call. Either negative or positive. You may wonder that what's the stress about their giving a negative result? Is a good news? Well. It's not a, I won't say it's a good news because there's something we call window period which we're going to talk about later. <laughs> the, the fact that the person is negative does not mean that that person is actually negative. So there's still need of one-on-one -on -one talk so that the person will go through risk assessments again and know how to prevent all the risks he has taken for granted before. It should not be repeated and the person will be told the negative result and possibility of window period and possibility of repeating, necessity of repeating the test after six months. So there's appropriate test in for post-test information for the negative, for the positive. A, a referral will be offered. Now, to provide post-test counseling to a woman, to a woman, help the woman to understand what the result is. I said to a woman because you have to consider if she's married. If she's married, then there are two at risk. There are two at risk. 
that means the, 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 the how do we get to the husband or the partner? If the person is not married, if the person is sexually active, maybe in a in a, in, a, in a relationship or uh, multiple partner, whichever one. If it's with a woman, those aspects has to be explored. Those aspects has to be explored. So allow the person to ask questions, provide the necessary information, and do the disclosure. If it's positive, if it's negative, do the disclosure. But one thing is very important. Whatsoever you want to say at the post you should have been briefed during the pretests. Ask about possibility of your partner joining you now. You want your partner to join you with the test. Do you want to receive the result together? Ask all these things before the post test so that it will be easy. So HIV negative result, again, talk about window period. Talk about prevention of future infection, review risk of a new infection, educate partner if there is a the major points in positive result, clarify understanding, make sure the person understands, acknowledge feelings, and uh, don't overlook the feeling the person may be crying. You have to talk along with the person's feeling. Address immediate concerns, schedule follow-up visit. You may not be able to talk everything at once. Take the name, the telephone number. It's not to discuss this thing, just to check up on the person and to, re to remind the person of the visit. Uh, that's very important. There are other aspects of it in the context of sexual assault. That one is very is high emotional. There can be anxiety, there can be depression. You have to flow with the person's uh, feeling. The cancer don't have to flow with the person's feeling. Sorry, I'm using you. Uh, permit me to use you or the counselor interchangeably. <laughs> so, counseling should be offered in a confidential way and uh, the, person, uh, the counselor has to be sensitive to the, uh, to the silence, allow the person to break the silence by his or herself, and uh, allow, help the person to control his or her feelings. So our feeling, our anger, and uh, also our blame. But it's important to let uh, the victim know that it is not our fault. I wanted to say it is our fault. I know men too are, can be raped, <laughs> but I don't know whether they report that. It's not reported. Uh, so it's important to let the person know that it's not our fault. The rape is not our fault. Look at targeting youth also. All over the world, 50% of the world, 50%, I mean, like between 8 and 24, are infected, or there are more than 50% of all those who are HIV positive. All over the world, 50% are youth. So, so there's need for HIV services for the youth. It's peculiar, it's not like any other HIV services. It has to be friendly in the sense that flexible. It may be integrated with other, maybe like club, where they go to club and there they can easily do HIV test and talk with the counselor. So it's a flexible one, like outreach, it can be outreach, it can be mobile, it can be at where the usual centers where they visit. <clears throat> it can be a center that's created for them, but highly recreational, which they be able to mix with peers, very important. And uh, and other things we, uh, that are being provided is to help them with peer pressure, self-esteem, negotiation skill. Apart from giving HIV information, and uh, I want a counselor has to be non-judgmental as much as possible. Offer free testing and condom. Make condoms available as much as possible. So assure confidentiality and. Uh, it has nothing to do with parental consent, freedom from parental consent. Then the test we do, it can use blood, it can use uh, saliva, and very easy and flexible. So lastly, the barrier to VCT, lastly on counseling, HIV counseling. One of those barriers are fear, 
fear of what if I'm positive, fear of there's no cure, fear of stigma. Oh, no need, I'm faithful. I have only one partner. But you don't know if that partner has multiple partners. Uh, my partner is HIV negative, so I don't need it. Then there's gender inequality in the sense that women tend to happen to do tests more than men because they get pregnant and it's part of the routine care because of prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV. So lack of uh, perceived benefit, at times when you don't perceive what benefit is, it can be a barrier, and lack of access to care and support. When you look around you, especially if you are from rural area, uh, you do it, who will support you there, who knows about it, unlike if you are in the city. So these are the possible barriers to VCT and uh, policies have been put in place to overcome them. Thank you. Okay. Let's talk about HIV testing. I first spoke about HIV counseling, now HIV testing. HIV testing is a procedure that determines the presence of antibodies or antigen in HIV in the blood with a view to ascertain one's HIV status. Like I told you, you know they show for face. You have to go into the blood to ascertain. That process of ascertaining is the HIV testing. And we're going to go into detail what it entails. So the, the, the process determines if the person is HIV positive or not, or is infected with HIV, or not infected with HIV. Yeah. And it can be through screening or through confirmation. You can screen. You want our kind of screening, not questionnaire screening. <laughs> it is screening by test. There are tests that we only screen, and there are tests that we confirm that truly it is HIV, there's HIV in the blood. Now, let's look at the selection of HIV tests. How do we select HIV tests? Because we say there's screening, there's confirmation, that means there are different types of tests. HIV tests are site specific and they are based on national and local policy. There are guidelines for HIV tests. So anybody cannot do HIV tests. However simple it may appear, or however quick one can observe it from another person, oh, I think I can do it. No, it has policy guiding it. And to determine to select which HIV test the one we use is availability of the supplies. Then laboratory support is very important. There has to be a link with the laboratory. Not just go and buy HIV test strips somewhere and be doing it for people. If problem breaks out, you're on your own. So there's need for laboratory support. Availability of trained personnel has to be put in place when we're considering the selection of HIV tests. Then evaluation of specific tests in the country and the costs. Those are the things we look into when we're selecting HIV tests. Now, the testing process. The testing process entails test sample, which can be blood, saliva, or urine. And the process the sample is going to, to go through either on site, when we mean on site, maybe in the community, it can be done in the community, it can be done mobile. Yeah, it can be mobile and it can be done in the lab. So the, 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 the process of running the test, the test sample, the process of running the test, obtaining test results, providing results to the client, providing post-test counseling. Remember we spoke about, or oh, I spoke about HIV counseling the other time, at the intro, HIV counseling and testing. 
there's HIV counseling, there's testing, there's HIV counseling. So there's the first one, pre-test counseling, the testing, that's what I'm talking about now. At the initial point when I spoke about counseling, I already spoke about pre-test and post-test counseling. But this HIV testing process is in between the two. You provide pre-test counseling, provide the testing, then the HIV post-test result. So the post-test, so in the process of the testing, the provision of the post-test counseling is the last aspect of it. The, te the testing technique, we have the antibody testing and we have the antigen like I said in the introduction. So the antibody testing is where we have the rapid HIV testing, we have the ELISA, and we have the Western blots. Those testing techniques, they make use, make use of antibody. And the other one is that of antigen testing viral acid. And there's something we call window period. I mentioned it the other time when I was talking about HIV test result. If it's negative, it doesn't mean absolute negative. It is a period of four to six weeks after HIV exposure when antibodies to HIV are not detectable in the blood. They are not yet detectable. It doesn't mean they are not there. They are not yet de detected. So it's like the incubation period. But when the person does the test within that four to six weeks of exposure, it may not pick the antibody. The body might not have produced antibody in case states, so it might not be detected. So a person at high risk who initially tests negative should be retested at three months to confirm the diagnosis. Very important. So when HIV negative test result is given, this information is very important. Let us look at ELISA versus rapid test for HIV. ELISA versus rapid test. Let's look at the sample. Where do we take the sample from? For ELISA, we take the sample from the arm, from this region, or wherever the vein is, is visible. Why for rapid test, a prick on the finger, just a prick, a little volume of blood, laboratory is needed for ELISA. There's limited need for laboratory for rapid testing. It can even be mobile because there are strips where you just open and run the test. It does not need electricity. I'm talking about rapid testing. Then let's look at the ease. ELISA tests require trained personnel, highly trained personnel, while rapid tests just re require minimal training. The result time for ELISA it may take up to a week, while for rapid tests within 30 minutes, the result is clear and ready. So looking at the antigen test, is a HIV antigen test detecting it in the blood, in the, in the HIV, in the blood. It must be done by laboratory personnel. It's a must. And the tests are PCR, polymerase chain reaction. We detect DNA or measure RNA and viral load in the blood. And like I said, highly trained laboratory personnel is a specialized lab laboratory test yeah, and it's very specific it's part of confirmatory tests diagnosing hiv in hiv exposed infants ahr prophylaxis reduces but does not eliminate mother to child transmission of hiv since maternal antibody the maternal antibodies cross the placenta. Antibody test is not recommended prior 18 months. If it is done for a child of less than 18 months, it is possible that we may be testing the antibody of the mother because it has crossed to the placenta. So it might be a false positive. 
before we can test the true state or HIV state of a baby, the baby has to be more than 18 months of age. The same way, after a mother, after weaning a child from breastfeeding, the child should do HIV testing again to be very sure that there's no transmission. So HIV PCR is used for this diagnosis. I mean the diagnosis in children. HIV PCR, I mean it tested specifically used for it. Now, now let's look at HIV disclosure. The test has been done. All the testing process, either in LISA or whichever one, has been confirmed. We are certain that HIV is in the blood of this person. How do we disclose? In the context of HIV, UN AIDS and WHO encourage beneficial disclosure of HIV status. Beneficial. That means you don't just disclose your positive, no? Oh, you are negative, you can go take your result. No, it has to be beneficial in the sense that if it's negative, we have to ensure continued negativity. If the person should come two years time, three years time, four years time, the person should remain negative, the way you are going to disclose the result. And if the person is positive, the person should not leave the counselor and go and commit suicide. The person should feel so supported and so, so relieved as if nothing happened to the person. Because the first slide I told us that it has physical, emotional, it has psychosocial implication on the mental state, the mental health of an individual. So that is why WHO insists that disclosure has to be beneficial. Number one, it has to be voluntary. These are the benefits of the disclosure. It should be voluntary. The person may say, oh, I don't think I'm ready for the results now. You don't force the result on the person. I know you have to take it. You must take it. It's your own. I may not be available next time. Allow the person to come back when the person is ready to take the result. After all, the counselor has provided the necessary pre-test information so the counselor should be rest assured that there is enough information to provide informed decision. So respect autonomy, respect dignity of the individual. It doesn't matter if the person is illiterate or literate. There's, uh, that's why they find the counselor is trained. Uh, these are the part of the things a counselor must put in check. Because in the, in the process of counseling, the counselor too must improve in quality. <laughs> There's a possibility of discriminating. When a professor comes in, oh, how are you, prof? You greet the professor very well. And if somebody who sells paper at uh, OJ Market comes, there's possibility of uh, um, a difference in treatment. Not disrespect, but difference. So WHO is running uh, counselors not to do that. There should be no difference. No difference. Give the result the same way with respect, with support. Make it confidential. It doesn't matter who the person is. It should be confidential. And lead, let the result lead to a beneficial one. The person should be able to open up on his or her risk. Even if the person is negative, will be able to say, ah, see, I've really been at risk. I used to do a commercial sales when it has been on that gym, on that ground. If I should have negative results, I mean God has saved me. The person should be, I mean, should be able to talk about continued prevention, how the person will stay negative evermore. And for the positive, lead the person, if it's possible to go with the person to the next point of care, follow the person is a support. The person will feel so supported. To the next point of care, fine. Instead of just sitting down and writing referral, the counselor should be able to do that. So disclosure of HIV status ensure confidentiality, respect choices, respect for women, respect their choices. Some may say, I don't want my husband to know now. You keep counseling until she agrees. And let her know the benefits of why she should disclose to her partner. 
and it might be a man who says that. So encourage partner testing, review prevention of transmission, and identify support. It may be online support, support group online. It may be physical support, support group. You should be able to connect that person. And you should be able to connect the person to any treatment center very close because you as a counselor, you have the list. Or I as a counselor, I have the list. I should be able to say, we are from Oboma Shop. No, there's a center as Oboma Shop and all this. I should have my information to the fullest, everything about the child. That's why a counselor has to update his or herself. Very so, still on the HIV testing, we got treatment after being positive. So, in the early years of HIV pandemic, people with HIV they didn't uh, they weren't living long because there was no medication. But now there's treatment. Is it does it cure? No, it does not cure. But what does it do? It reduces the viral load. It truncates the process by which the virus replicates itself because it replicates in millions. So the process and the site of replication are blocked by this medication. They are scientifically proven, tested, and they work well. Very effective. They block the site of the replication and once the viral cannot replicate, the viral reduces, they die off. Can they die off completely of the blood? Well, I will, I will not say yes, because there may still be a measure in the blood. But can the person infect another person while on treatment? Studies have shown that the infection rate is reduced. The, the probability of they infecting another person is reduced. But even at that, the person must protect, must be very protective. So the antiretroviral and medication for the treatment of infection by retroviruses, especially HIV. And there are like eight, like 30 antiviral drugs all over the world today. And they are in different classes. We have the nucleoside reverse transcriptase in vitro, nucleotide reverse transcriptase in vitro, uh, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase in vitro, protease in vitro, integrase in vitro different types and they are given in different combinations by experts, not just anybody. It's not, you can't walk up to a pharmacy and be buying them and be using them in combination. No, no. Experts, trained experts give them. And that's why one has to go to uh, treatment centers and there are treatment centers all over Nigeria. There are there are many in your state. In Ibadan, we have like uh, four University College Hospital, Adiyo Your Maternity Hospital, St. Mary's Catholic Hospital, Olu Yoro Hospital, and we have two in Obomosho Baptist Medical Center, and uh, Oyo State Specialist Hospital, we have two in Shaki, and then in Oyo Town, like that, and nationwide. So, the anti drugs do not cure people of HIV or AIDS. They suppress the virus by preventing replication, even to undetectable level. The person may do viral load, may not, but yet, still that, that the person must prevent, must prevent. It suppresses the amount of virus in the body of the infected person, uh, but the person may still transmit. It is possible, very possible. So who qualifies for antiretroviral therapy? Any HIV positive person qualifies for antiretroviral therapy. And that's why the person has to get to the treatment center. If there's otherwise decision on delay of commencement of uh, antiretroviral therapy, it has to be the decision of the experts, of the doctors. Based, uh, it has to be based on that. So, and there are so many things they put in, in the consider uh, in placing people on antiretroviral therapy. So, treatment as prevention is also uh, possible. Um, the pre-exposure, if there is an exposure, a rape, or accidental exposure, maybe as a health worker, you have accidental needle prick, there are prophylaxis 
which is the use of these drugs to prevent the person from being uh, from the virus entering into the blood replicating and it has a specific uh, duration of time that the person should report. Care and support is available for people living with HIV AIDS and there is policy to protect them. Nobody should be sapped because of HIV status. There is a policy back on that. The person should be given an opportunity to go for treatment. There's medical care. There used to be very, many free medical treatment, even for uh, giving birth, child birth for children with HIV uh, by federal government before. But now, I think it's still at a reduced rate. And then laboratory services, uh, pharmacological services, and so on and so forth. Then there's this self-help group. Among themselves, they are helping themselves to access uh, treatment and all those things. Now, let's look at the role of the youth. The role of the youth is to live a protected life. To be protected is a responsibility. To be protected. You may not need to know HIV status of every sex partner, but protect yourself. Once you protect yourself, you protect the other person, and you are protected. It's a rule. You have to be informed. Youth have to be responsible. Respect others. Show care and support to anybody who you know who is living with HIV. The ultimate support, information necessary to the person that you have, give it. Respect the person. The fact that one doesn't have it, some, it might be true blood transmission, you cannot be judgmental. So the role of youth is very, very important. Conclusion, HIV prevention is better than cure. Prevention begins with knowing one's HIV status. So know 